Hey there, and welcome back. So in the previous video, we show how to, to do the coupling Dakota open form with a very simple application, probably not very challenging. So in this new video, it will be a series of video, same case, different methods, just to show you something a little bit more complicated. It's still, it is easy because we're going to work to the, but we're going to do some shape optimization. But before doing that, introducing the problem, I want to revisit some basic uh, concepts. So we're going to, to do, we're going to talk about practical numerical optimization, CFD, and the cold coupling. Uh, Dakota open form. So before going to that case, now let's remind you, let me remind you what, what is optimization. So basically this is definition. I, I think I don't need to define this, but this is his definition. It is you know, the, the art of obtaining the best result under given uh, circumstances. Okay. So basically our ultimate goal will be Optim uh, will be optimized something and that optimized means that we can minimize, maximize or equalize a quantity of interest. And important, I'm going to use this terminology, quantity of interest, okay? In literature, maybe it will be fun objective function and so on, okay? We'll call it a quantity of interest and can be anything, okay? So in order to optimize this quantity of in interest, we should be able to measure that quantity, quantitatively or qualitatively. Okay, it doesn't matter how we measure, and this is the tricky part sometimes when we do optimization. It can be really tricky to know how to measure that. So many times we want to do, for, for example, classical example, drag reduction, and that is easy. But then there are some other quantities that are not very easy to quantify. And with another case, I will show you, you know, what I'm talking about. So we need to use some different techniques. And well. In the broadest sense, optimization can be used to any any real life or engineering problem. Okay, so there is no limitation. Basically, as you can measure it, uh, you can optimize it. So we're going to talk about here using all these techniques to CFD, but it can be used to anything. Okay, so let's move. So just to remind you, and just to uh, probably it will sound like a broken record on this, but it's very important to know that you need to measure that quantity. Okay, so you can measure that quantity, you can optimize it, and also you should measure that quantity in the right way. So there are many methods now to, to arrive to our optimal solution here in this simple case that we're going to introduce. So we're going, maybe I'm going to add a little bit some level of complexity. So this first, first one will be 2D. Okay, very simple, but we're going to see how we have many tools and how to optimize them. But then we're going to add some extra level of complexity. And to do the optimization, we're going to use one single tool that probably you are here, you know, that we're going to, you, to use the coda, but it's important to stress that you can use any tool. All the tools, the optimization methods are exactly the same. What is going to change is just the user experience, okay? How you interact with libraries and so on. So particular, particular speaking, I really like Dakota, how I can do all the coupling and so on. So later on, I will going to talk about that, but you can use any tool, okay? Have that in mind. So very important. We need to sort of formulate the optimization problem, okay? It's not like I go and sit down in front of my computer and then I go, okay, I want to do this, or probably I go chat GPT, do this. Uh, it might be possible. And this, uh, this is something that I'm trying to do. Probably you have seen that I'm doing some uh, stable diffusion videos. And my idea is trying to couple these diff image diffusion techniques with some other large, large language models. I'm, large visual models also we can call those that is the diffusion to do some optimization so i'm trying to disrupt myself how i do optimization i think it is possible but probably I haven't found the right way so probably if you have some ideas and if you want to collaborate let me know but i'm trying to go there but i'm not telling you I'm not saying that that will be the solution. That will be another approach. Okay, there are many ways to do it. So I'm trying just to, to do that disruption there. So in any case, we need to formulate that problem. We are going to talk about a design vector. I'm going to call it 
x. And here we have all our design variables. So for instance, if you have a geometry and that geometry, you can control it with 10 points. This will be the 10 points, like coordinates, for instance, an airfoil, as you have 100 points, well, you have 100 points as a design vector that you need to somehow control to change your shape. So you start to see that this design vector is a bit constrained because the more you have, the more functions, evaluations you need to do. So since can be expensive from the computational point of view, if whatever you are doing, it is expensive. If it is inexpensive, well, put there 1 million variables and it doesn't matter because it is inexpensive. But we know that in CFD, it seems tends to be expensive. So then we need to say what we want to do. Okay, we want to minimize, maximize, or equalize that quantity. And the problem formulation changes a little bit depending on what, what is your, your goal there. And then you measure that quantity of interest, not necessarily it's one, can be many of them. And the more quantity of interest that you have, these things get a little bit more trickier and also you we need to use different optimization methods different techniques different approaches okay so this is how we formulate the problem then also that problem doesn't go like that like i say okay minimize this you said we need to add some some constraints okay so those constraints can be linear non-linear constraints that we have here and it's very important uh, to define this one if you have them but also it's very important that do not over constrain your problems and sometimes it might happen that you add many constraints and you are going to converge to what you think it is your ideal optimal solution so be careful about that and it's very important because this first test case that we're going to do it is a problem that we over constrain it to arrive to that specific solution and it is our reference solution. So kind of it is a manufactured uh, solution that we over constrain just to get that one. Okay. Just to be sure that any method should arrive to that, to that solution. Okay. So this is how we formulate the problem and talking about the design vector and it's something called the course of dimensionality. And basically the more design variables that you have, okay, the more simulations I'm talking about CFD, the more simulations that you need to do to construct you know, uh, a, a good predictor, because at the end of the day, that's what we want a predictor to predict. So, so, so this is our, you no, know, the big hard, the, the biggest hardware in, in numerical optimization. So there are different techniques to overcome this. And if we have time and well, for sure, we're going to have time to talk about a little bit of joint optimization, which is another fantastic technique, but also it's not always the solution to that problem. Okay. So let me go here, a brief overview of optimization methods here. I can talk a lot about this and basically I can, can talk about a whole month about this, but I don't have time. I, this is just an introduction, but if somebody wants to sponsor this, just let me know now because it's, it takes time. But any case, so basically we can talk about design optimization and design space exploration. So design optimization, I like to call it like converging iterative process. So basically we're converging to something. So we start from our point, then we move in a space following some methods. So it can be a gradient based method, derivative free method, whatever. And then you arrive to the optimal value. So here you are starting point. It is the green circle here. And then your final point, the optimal solution is this one. Then you move in this trajectory. So this, this problem is an optimization. They are based in formulating a problem. Remember the, the, the that, that is like, it's very important. Okay. You need to formulate a problem. This implies that you need to give a starting point. Also, you need to give some other information like step size, how you want to compute gradients. If you are using gradient based methods, or if you are using derivative free method, how you, how, what are the optimal parameters or let's use a terminology used in machine learning because here also enters machine learning, which is hyperparameters. So sometimes you need to optimize the optimizer to get the best hyperparameters because you have many variables that can change anything. So yeah, this is the design optimization. So you need to define your problem. Okay. Then the other uh, way to do this is design a space exploration. This is the way I like to proceed. Okay. Well, I proceed in both, both ways. First design a space exploration, and then I go design optimization, but design space exploration, the broader sense, I can say that it's something that is a divergent iterative process. It is divergent in the sense that you are not converging to a solution. You are just, uh, 
exploring your design space. And it might happen that in that ex exploration, you will find that optimal solution. I don't know, but it might happen. But basically, you are exploring, you are ex extracting knowledge. So basically, this is the foundation of machine learning and that buzzword that is started by A and ends in I. So I guess you know what is that. So that is your foundation. You need to do a lot of sampling. You need to get a lot of information and get if getting that information is expensive like in cfd that is a big problem this is my my, my main main critic about machine learning in, in cfd when things are expensive but in any case i'm trying to 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 disrupt how how it will work but mainly i i am working more in using large language models and large uh and large image models you know to, to do that and stable diffusion techniques and so like that. I have my idea in mind, but I don't want to go and put my machine learning model here because I know it is expensive. And I will show you a test case. Now for that machine learning, I'm going to use XGBoost. But that is fantastic. So if you know what is that, later I'm going to show you. If you know what is that, stay tuned because later we're going to work on that. So in any case, here we're not doing anything, just exploring you now following some specific technique that you would like to cover the space and that's all. Okay, then you can do with this that 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 a lot. Uh but important these figures that you see here you see just two axes okay two dimensions or variables just to illustrate the problem but you can have many variables okay not necessarily you are constrained to two variables you can have two ten a hundred as also variables. Okay. So then you need to go to a hyperparameter space and see everything there. In any case, just for visualization purposes, I just put in two variables. Then the other technique is surrogate based optimization. Probably also I need to add here machine learning. So surrogate based optimization is also is just taking the design space exploration and using that information, you, you construct a model. Okay. That's all. A meta model, let's say, because or using that data, you construct your meta model or predictor model or response or phase. Okay, many people write to call it that like that. If you have three variables, or you, you can use that response or phase. If you have more than that, I think it's not valid anymore. It's better to call it a, a meta model, a model of a model. Yeah. So this is what you do. And as soon as you have this meta model, okay, you can do whatever you want in this meta model because you will have an analytical representation of that. So whatever you do will be inexpensive. So there are many ways to do that, to, to construct this meta model. So you can use polynomial reconstruction, creating interpolation, neural networks, machine learning, all that stuff, all that, those buzzwords that are, are around today, all that stuff you can put in there or use more traditional methods like a simple linear interpolation or quadratic interpolation, cubic interpolation, or no, splines and so on. So there is a lot there. I'm not going into details, but basically now when I talk about design space exploration, just to mention that the main goal here is just to explore your design space at a minimal cost. You need to gather uh, data and you want to do it at a minimal cost, but that is inevitable. It's always, it will be expensive and the more accurate that you want that predictor, the more data you, you need. So it will be expensive. But when you do that, you are gaining you no know, deep statistical understanding. And with that, you can do a lot of things. Okay. This machine learning stuff, I'm not going into more details there. Uh, here also, I will talk about something called DAS. DAS is design analysis of computer experiments. Okay. So when we do numerical simulation, probably it's better to use this terminology. Okay. Then probably literature, you will see a lot design of experiments. Design of experiments is more for physical experiments. That's a more for numerical experiments. And the main difference will be that in Adobe, you will conduct an experiments and it is, can be repetitive. So for instance, if you're measuring temperature, you measure the temperature today, tomorrow, and one week later, just to see repetition or get some seasonality because that experiment can depend on that. Instead, numerical experiments, they tend to be, uh, they don't, they don't have any seasonality. They are deterministic. Okay. You run it, you run it today, tomorrow, or one year later, you should get the same, the same result unless you change something in your source code. So that is the main difference, but in any case, just a little bit of the jargon that I'm going to use. So then uh, as soon as the techniques that you can use, like remember that I'm talking about that I'm using just two dimensions just to illustrate this one, but basically you want to distribute many uh, different experiments in your design space, and then you measure the quantity and then 
construct your model. So the best one would be multidimensional studies that you cover in a uniform way all your design space. So you see here in 2D, you will say, okay, I will do it in 2D because it's inexpensive. But now imagine that you have multivariate problem that you have 10 design variables is you try to do a grid like this that will be super expensive okay so then you need to choose some other methods like latin hyper-q sampling and stuff like that um with that data okay you can do a lot of stuff uh, i started to do this a, a while ago and i still recall when people used to to call this big data and exploratory data analysis now everything is machine learning, but in any case, it's the same, okay, for me. And then the other method, and this should be moving, okay, these are figures, so this should be moving, so just interactive, and then you just, you know, filter data, and you can get a lot of knowledge, models, and so on. Uh, the other method is uh, gradient-based optimization, so here we use, no, a method, a gradient based method. There are different techniques, and the idea is that you start from a point, you need to formulate a, a problem here. Remember, instead of the previous one, basically, you need to formulate a problem. You just say, okay, I want to do 10,000 experiments and use this method, and that's all. Here, you need to do your formulation, a starting point, gradient method, how to compute gradients, step size, and so on. So it can be tricky, okay? You need to, to have some knowledge of what you are doing. So basically, this is what you do. Start from here and then you move and in an iterative way, you arrive to, to your optimal solutions and they can be very, very efficient, these methods, but they have also some, some drawbacks. So have some positive aspect, but also they have some drawbacks. So usually when you have noisy functions, it can get into troubles now to get it to the optimal value because it's the fact that the function is not more, it's, it's multimodal, so that gradient can get stuck in a peak now, so that can be a problem. Uh, then the other method to avoid, you know, the, the, the drawbacks that you have with your gradient-based method, mainly the main one would be uh, noise, is derivative-free method. So these are fantastic also, there are many techniques, but the problem of these methods is that they are expensive. They require many, many functions evaluations, now kind of design space exploration. So here you are not using any gradient, gradient informations or most of these methods, well, they're called derivative-free, but there are some other categories that kind of a mix between derivative free or gradient that can somehow introduce that gradient information. But in any case, you don't use that information, but you move there kind of by brute force until you find that point. So here we have how it will work. Now this is the famous, this is how it works, the simplex methods. And then we have here now multi-objective optimization. So you keep iterating until you find now this is called the Pareto front. Now the, this is your, your optimal solution. So you cannot get any better than this green points there. So you see that how everything is iterating, but it's just brick for brick force. You need to, to do a lot of iteration. So here we have a small decision matrix, what methods to use. So here I'm focused by the way in uh gradient based methods, derivative free methods, design space exploration. Here I'm not using the I'm not talking about a joint optimization, a joint optimization is something different. However, a joint optimization can use these techniques to get to that optimal value, okay? So I like to make the difference that a join is a global, uh, like, uh, a local method in the sense that it will compute sensitivities for every single point. Instead, these methods are local. Local, uh, global, sorry. Global in the sense that you need an integral quantity and using that integral quantity, you move. It's difficult to see that that, that, that that image that I'm trying to convey, but I like to see it like that. But later we're going to probably we get a better better idea. Okay, so I forgot to mention that here now depending that is you have, for instance, a smooth and expensive uh, function. Okay, basically any method will work, but gradient ba a base will be the fastest and probably will pinpoint the best optimal value. Okay, however, in reality, we have something that is non-smooth and expensive in CFD. So if you are lucky, you can have something that's smooth and expensive. So it's still reading based methods will work, but it requires a good problem formulation, it requires to know a little bit what is happening. But usually we're going to be here. And in the worst case scenario that many times will happen, you need to do multi-objective optimization. And here you need to go with derivative-free optimization and methods that are super expensive or surrogate-based optimization, which is I have to say equivalent to machine learning, okay? So just to use that model terminology. Okay, 
So basically, uh, just to end here, that uh, uh, there are many methods. Now, I, I like to to proceed using uh, design space exploration, and then as soon as you get some knowledge of what is happening in my design space, I can move and use gradient based methods. Okay, but always this is this is a, a big problem. You know? the, the the course of dimensionality. You usually you're going to have many many design battles, so it can be a little bit expensive. But also depends on the resources that you have available. So if you have a thousand cores, it's like you can use this one and get a solution very fast. However, a way to circumvent this problem is the, as I mentioned, is that joint optimization that we can see something local that you are going to get sensitivities of everything in one function evaluation. Instead, using all the global methods that I like to call these two, let's say, you need to evaluate for every single design variable you need to compute a gradient or move using all you know, the rules defined in this method so it can be tends to be a little bit expensive but that joint is not a silver bullet it's not always the good technique but it works really well okay and i like to use you not know, that joint for fine tuning so i start with design space exploration then when i understand what is happening i move to gradient based methods and after i get a good solution using gradient based or derivative free methods i move and you fine tune okay you get that five percent two three percent using the adjoint method that i'm not going into details but basically it will take all the inputs of your cfd solvers and when i mean inputs when i say inputs i, I mean surface mesh interior mesh boundary conditions physical pro properties, models, anything that you can put in that model, it will take it. So namely that anything will be the mesh, anything in your mesh and boundary conditions, you put it there. Okay. Then you solve your primal equations, your Navier-Stokes equation, the direct problem. Solving this one, your Navier-Stokes equations, then you have all your outputs okay you have all your field data including what is coming from here boundary conditions that and your mesh are basically a source search and you pass it to an joint solver that joint solver is a another formulation of your navier stokes equations okay so you, you can see that as an inverse formulation of this one so there is a lot of mathematics involved there okay but you solve these equations using all that information and this equation is going to give you all the sensitivities in your space all the sensitivities of these input variables for this output so your quantity of interest or your quantity of interest so having this one then you are going to have sensitivities and it's going to give you a lot of information how your design space change so it's very efficient but it's not always the solution so Hopefully, I'm going to show you that in OpenFone, okay? Or probably using Fluent, that is this is one and very, very effective. So now let's talk about the CFD optimization loops, okay? The big picture, just to, before moving to the text case. So the big picture is quite simple. You pick up an optimization tool. I like to use the code of that optimization tool. According to the method that you use, it's going to get generation input parameters that you are going to fit into your black box application. The black box application can be anything okay then this black box application is going to generate an output that output you need to put it in the let's say in in the format that the optimization tool likes to use and you keep looping okay so this is the easiest way to look at that a little bit more detail now talking about a general optimization loop can be sketched at something like that so you have your problem formulation remember it's very important to formulate your problem then you pass that to your optimizer uh, optimi optimizer no the tool that is going to to do the code code coupling and so on that interface you have your design variables you need to identify that everything is coming from your problem formulation black box tool Black box tool, remember, you need to measure your quantity of interest on how it doesn't matter how you measure that, you need to measure to be able to measure that. And this is the information that you need for your sensitivities. Then you compute your sensitivities. There are many methods to compute that sensitivities and see that I hear I talk about adjoint, surrogate, derivative free method, gradient method. So basically, any of these techniques is just to get sensitivity, how the solution change in the space. Some methods are faster than others and so on. and then after you have that information you update your design variables so here's where you can put some you no know, human decision maker or a robot you no know, ai robot and an robot and keep iterating until you reach 
some certain level of convergence. So important that you have a lot of data. You see here that you are moving a lot of data, so you need to collect data and, the, and do real-time monitoring because this loop needs to be fault tolerant. So imagine that in one case, there is a problem and then everything stops and that is unacceptable. So somehow you need to control that or sometimes you are running a computer, a power failure, and then you lose everything. So you need to save data, save gradient information, so save iteration information. Okay and how you need to get that information. And all this stuff, then we go to another set that we can use it to do uncertainty quantification, optimization under uncertainty and robust design, okay? So to guarantee that you always get the best design, it does even if you get some noise in the inputs or something else. Okay, so a little bit more specific and let's go to an application in CFD. So probably you're familiar, this is the Hammett body that very famous in CFD. So basically, let's say that you want to optimize this one. Okay, you have your input. So in this case, our input it is the geometry parameterized on how you have your coupling interface, your code that you are using to do the coupling. Then you want to do concurrent simulations. And what do I mean by this? Meaning that you can launch many simulations at the same time. So you need to exploit your computational resources. Okay, don't do things sequentially because they are slow. And today. Computational power is, is quite cheap, okay? So talking about my portable, I have 32 cores in my portable. So I still don't believe that, but yeah, I do have 32 cores. It's not it's not perfect now because you have those performance efficiency cores. But in any case, I have a lot of computational power. Do your parameterization, black box tool, measure quantity of interest. So see that you can measure CD or you can have colors and, and vortices. And this is very interesting because you say, okay, most of the time you're interested in this quantity, but maybe you might be interested in reducing the vortex intensity. So how do you measure that? Because there is no definite uh, integral quantity to do that. So there is something that I'm working on. This is where these diffusion models uh, that, that I'm doing, all this stuff that I'm doing, I want to use it to to, to, to analyze my images. So I use some uh, image recognition techniques and so on to do that. I don't want to go into details, compute sensitivities, then optimal candidates and see that you, you change your geometry and get looping. And this is how it works. So what is interesting here that my call coupling optimizer tool now is Dakota, then Dakota is also controlling all the concurrent simulations, all the parallel stuff for parametric CAD and using on shape. So you start to see that things can get very complex. So on shape is a cloud-based uh, CAD tool. It's a professional tool, fantastic. If you don't know it, you're missing a lot. So Google this and you will find it. So I'm using the API in Python just to connect everything open from or any, any software. For instance, sometimes I, I use a code with Fluent, okay? And then a lot of post-processing. Usually, as you can see here, there is a lot of post-processing to do in fault tolerance. So everything is based Python, Paraview, JavaScript, and so on, okay? So there is a lot of post-processing involved. So you will need to learn a little bit post-processing. However, I recommend you to, 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 to use Python. Also, R is fantastic, okay? So just tool. All fantastic. And to remind you, you know, the workflow in a CFD simulation, usually we, we do like this, you no know, geometry, mesh, case et al, post-processing and so on. Okay, but this is a singular simulation. And this is just to talk about, you need to explore your computational resources. So when I talk about parallel synchronous simulations or concurrent driver, this is what I'm telling. You can run many of these vertical workflows at the same time, and each one can be in parallel. So imagine that you have access to a thousand cores, you can run, let's say, 100 simulations with 10 cores, okay? Or 10 simulations with 100 cores, any, any, any combination, but exploit that. So you need to have a tool that is able to do that. So another reason why I do like to, 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 to use Dakota, because you can, do, you can do that. So also know your hardware, exploit your hardware. So in the end of the day, everything that we're doing, okay, we want to have concurrency, automation, parameterization. And the goal is to do things automatically, but also do, do things right. And I like to point out now to this beautiful report, okay, if you haven't read it, I recommend you to read it. And it's quite fun. It has been around for a while, but always it is revised and always they are delaying all the goals. So many of the things that they, they, they state in the original one, 
we are not going to to they are not going to to, to arrive to to those objectives in 2030 they they are just uh uh prorogating you know, the, the the date so but but it's interesting that one of the statements that are in this report that as they say that a single engineer must be able to conceive create analyze large ensemble of data in time critical periods okay that is something that at this point i'm able to do okay and this is a hopefully would be your main takeaway using dakota being able to do a lot of things in time critical periods but while we're ch we have a check mark for this or probably a partial one because things sometimes are tricky but in any case i can say that this is a check mark there are many stuff and i think the the biggest elephant that you have in in this one is turbulence modeling okay turbulence modeling it is around and we have it there then also they talk about machine learning but that is and i don't worry about that i worry about terminal not only turbulence model about models because you have models can be many many things many types of physics but basically the most famous one is turbulence okay so now before ending let, let's go to, to let me show you now the Dakota overview so i'm not going into too many details so dakota the tool you have it here i strongly recommend it, the latest version 6.19 for the time of this recording okay so it's this one and you can do many things with dakota here you have the capabilities of pretty much you know, anything related to optimization and design space exploration, you can do it here. But not only that, okay, there you can do much, much more. So why the code and why not MATLAB, Scilab, Octave, Python, whatever, or any tool that you wrote or in C++ or even Excel, why not using one of those? And the main reason here, I have this reason, but the most important ones is simulation failure, capturing, restarting capabilities and parallel asynchronous or concurrent evaluation. And this is why I use it. So simulation failure capturing means that the simulation can fail, the computer can have a problem, um, your optimization loop can stop, but you can restart whatever you're doing. And you have that restarting cap capabilities. And then if you have enough resources, you can launch many simulations at the same time. So these are my main reasons. Then you have the others, you know, fully scriptable, extensively validated, but parallel. You have also, very important by the way, generic interface to black box solver. So you can connect anything to the coda if you can launch it from the common line interface. It can be scripted. If you have a graphical user interface, it can be done, and probably I will show you some 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 work that we have done using SolidWorks, or no Fusion 2D, so 3D, sorry, thrown out of this to do that. Fantastic, it can be done, but it's tricky. But in any case, the the if you can script whatever you're doing, it will work, and then well, it's open source, no license fee, and also very important, it can be linked to third party optimization libraries. So if you have that small optimization script that you program in Python or C++, you can link it there. It's not easy, by the way, but you can do it. Uh, important that Dakota, how does it work? It will read an input file like OpenFone. So we're going to do Dakota OpenFone. So I guess you have used OpenFone and you're a little bit familiar with those input files. It is an idea. You have a sing one single input file. In that one single input file, you formulate your problem and that's all. So uh, a sample file will look like this. So you have this entry, so six entries or let's say five entries this one is optional i'm not going to mention anything i'm going to go out here fast but basically see here that you are formulating your problem here's just to save you, you, your, your data so you are doing something you need to save your output then choose your method define design variables how do you want to interface everything so you have that quota but then you want to connect tools so this interface see us when you are Launching an open phone simulation will be block mesh, simple phone or phone run, paraview, whatever the steps that you want to follow. And those steps can be in parallel, by the way. And then your output, you no, know, your quantity of interest. That's all. So the big picture in Dakota will be something like this that you have Dakota. Dakota, you can you know, program you know, your sequential of concurrent evaluations. Dakota will generate some parameter files according to whatever you want to, to do. So these parameter files, then you enter into this gray block that represents you now your simulation, your black box tool. And this parameter file 
needs to be filtered into the format that your black box solver likes. So you, you filter that. So there is a specific technique. We have seen that, but we're going to revisit that. Then the black box tool that remember it can be in parallel. Many processes at the same time will generate an output that you need to filter. Okay. So this to the format that Dakota likes, and then keep looping and that's all. So this is our big picture. Then we go into a little bit more details, basically what you do. And let me focus here because here is those filters, whatever that when you do that, you need to create a template directory or template files. These are your parametrical files because you are going to have a few parametrical files since that you want to change. So these parameters that the code is generated are going to, to be changed here. You are going to do an automatic replacement. So see that these are two inputs and here there is some script that I'm going to replace that is going to replace something. So for instance, it can be velocity or can be coordinates of an airfall or a wind, whatever. So there is some scripting involved. Luckily for you, Dakota will do that automatically. Then also very important when you do that, you need to have a starting point, a case base that you know it is working. So before launching your simulation, you need to run a single case to be sure that it's running. Okay. So since needs to be uh, foolproof and after that, just go and keep looping. Okay. So this is how it works. Uh, well, a few of the techniques implemented in Dakota. By no means, this is a complete list. There is many, a lot of stuff. And in theory, you have infinite options because you can couple Python, you can Python, you can put it here and you can have all the methods. And very important, final slide and solid, sorry that was, this was a little bit long, <laughs> but uh, Dakota have very good documentation. Okay. So I recommend you to visit the documentation. Also, there is a very good support group. So if you have questions, just put it there. Everything is the GitHub uh website they, they have everything there so yeah this is all okay so now let me show you in the next video what is the problem our first problem so thanks for your attention and hope to see you next time